What I remember most about Aberdeen in the 20s was the bustling energy of it all. The more expansion, the more staff, and that meant social amenities. We even had a police station, if you can call that a social amenity. And believe it or not, to be quite up to date, we had a cinema. Silent, of course, except for the pianist. We had a clubhouse, a mosque, and... Oh, I forgot. We had a train. And being an oil refinery, we had to have a fire brigade. Proper precautions they were. But well trained, though. After all, you never quite knew when something might break out. Although we didn't have much time for relaxation, at least it was possible to have a little fun. Regattas on the pump house pond, and kidding ourselves it was Henley. And just to show that we were sorry for pushing the horse out of business, we started to run our own races. And hotly contested they were too, women jockeys as well as men. And on these occasions, as like as not, you'd find us in odd corners, chatting with the locals. These people and their land had given us much. And from the first, we'd done our best to do as much for them. Schools, hospitals and such like. Appropriately enough, it was our medical officer, Dr. Young, who had become the best known Englishman in Persia. Yes, between us, we were changing the face of the land. And it was only by continuing to work together that we could realize the tremendous future that lay ahead. The mood of the oil men reflected the mood of the world. And new horizons awaited both. By now, the ships whose very shape proclaimed their business were sailing the seas in greater numbers to France, Belgium, Norway, Germany, and all Europe, to Australia, India, New Zealand, and the Far East. And wherever oil went, once again there was pioneering, refineries, distribution, marketing. Once again, enterprise, settled, established, ever-growing. For this wondrous stuff called oil is always a driving force, not only of machines, but of ideas in the minds of men. And in its use, as in its finding, the pattern is repeated. First, the pioneers, breaking new ground, taking the risks, making it safe for others to follow. Then, adaptation, steadiness, consolidation. Oil and the world were going forward together, for oil is the story of our time. It's remarkable, looking back, how closely our history did reflect the general history of our time. Take the year 1933. Though we didn't know it, that was a milestone for us all. It certainly was for us. That year, a new agreement was drawn up with the Persian government, revising the terms of the old Darcy Agreement. Darcy, who died in 1917. I wonder whether he realised what he'd started. Yes, by now things had changed quite a bit. It's wonderful what a few years and a little experience can do. By now, we knew where Reynolds had been guessing. We knew, for instance, 
that there were some pretty terrifying forces loose down there. If we hadn't been lucky in Reynolds' day, we'd have blown ourselves to pieces. Now we had the tools, the know-how, and the equipment in a really big way. And the place was beginning to look like it. Yes, by now there were a few more boilers and chimneys on the shores of that Persian river. Abadan, the greatest oil refinery in the world. By 1933, an enterprise producing over 7 million tons of oil a year. Yes, we could safely say that we had much to be proud of in Persia. The name of my country was changed from Persia to its ancient name, Iran. Yet, the ancient land was no longer what it was. The name harked back, but the land looked forward to see the soil take on new life and meaning. No land, no people can experience this and not feel stirred. Maybe a little frightened as they adapt themselves, adjust themselves, and learn. There was other wealth that lay untapped in Persia, the only real form of wealth that any country knows. And if the one could but help the other to find release, it looked as though Persia might find prosperity and peace. Well, peace was a thing we were soon to lose. But for us, these uneasy years were a venturing forth, seeking fresh fields and pastures new. Sending echoes down through the virgin rock. And by the answer that we got, plotting, pinpointing, deciding, choosing from vast areas 100,000 square miles. For that was the zone laid down in the new agreement. And by 1938, we'd done the choosing and our choice was sound. New and fruitful fields were opened up. Soon we were laying miles of pipeline to cope with the steady increase of production. To carry away oil from the new fields at Haftkel, Agajari and Lali. And by 1938, from all our undertakings, 10 million tons of oil were flowing through to Abadan. There too the plant was growing, expanding, building not only to deal with the flow of oil, but to put into practice new ideas and new conceptions. For in the realm of science too, men had been busy, finding out about this stuff called oil, finding out ways of making the most of it, ways that were going to prove vital. Once before it had been a race against time, this time, again though we didn't know it, we were going to be ready when it came. And this time when it came, the wheels of war had left forever their time-worn ruts. War, like oil, was fluid, mobile, reflecting the tempo and the habits of the modern world. And 
when death struck, machines like dying soldiers lay helpless as their lifeblood drained away into the sand. And the tide of war reached Persia, and there was action, even death, to write upon the record. To an enemy thirsting for oil, the fabulous towers of Abaddon glittered truly like those of an eastern fable. Towards them, she reached out avidly through Greece and Crete and Syria. But like any eastern mirage, they were to remain forever unattainable. Towards the close of 1941, British troops marched in. Two years of deep frustration were ended. Two years of a vital oil supply, half strangled by the tentacles of war. Now, safeguarded, secure, this mighty plant was free to set to work, free to harness its vast resources to the urgent task at hand, to become the very pulse and strength of the Middle East Allied war machine. was that, back to humdrum days of peace. And yet, there's excitement in the most unlikely places. For those who have the eye to see it, it's there, behind the concrete formality and the morning mail. For here is the real glory, the interests, the enthusiasms and the grumbles, the record of what men are doing now to keep a mighty enterprise alive. For oil is not made, it's got. From that fact will always spring its huge and rough vitality. Oil thinks large. Oil thinks wide. Oil is all-embracing. You can plan a refinery in England, Belgium or in Scotland, and all that goes with it. You can build a tanker in a British shipyard or on the banks of a French river. You can be carrying oil to any part of the world, by the shipload north to Stockholm or south to Sydney, through the canals of Holland, beneath the castles of the Rhine, taking it up to the heights of the Alps, or to the primitive villages on the sweltering equator. Oh yes, if you yearn for pioneering in the old style, it's still there, plenty of it. Building a bridge in Persia, or sweating it out in Papua, for oil is where you find it. And if you don't, well, maybe you find yourself. For oil is a trying taskmaster. Or maybe your pioneering takes a different twist into even stranger fields. And here, there's no limit. Or there's something else you can be doing. You can be fostering the growth of whole communities, new towns, villages, hospitals, schools and homes. And there, progress can only be measured against what was there to start with. In a city born from a sandy waste, even a water tap can be a near miracle. For progress, too, is where you find it. For progress is people. Yes, there, too, you can build, or teach somebody else to build, something even more enduring than an oil refinery or a tanker. An enterprise, an organization, is but a company of men, a gathering of human beings. And the sum total of their efforts is to achieve a better life. And in doing it, to provide an outlet for men's talents, urges, and their dreams. 